to Talent Hub TV episode 14. We're here with Patrick Buarch today. Uh, I've got a whole host of questions for you, so uh, thank you for coming along. No drama, thank you for having me. Uh, Patrick, tell us a bit about your career before Salesforce. Uh, my career before Salesforce was uh, probably non-existent. Um, <laughs> no, not said that. I had, a, I had my own business, which I was a web developer and designer back in, you know, this is going back 12 plus years yeah. when you could do everything and people went, okay, you're somewhat creative, the internet's new, you can put a website up, those sorts of things. And that was fresh out of university effectively. On the side, I worked for SBS, I had a radio show. No way, so yeah. this, this is all natural to see. Oh, oh, absolutely, the camera, oh, the the camera loves me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a face for radio. <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a radio show with a, a radio station, which was like a youth radio station called Alchemy. Um, we did like top world number ones around the world. And yeah. It was silly, but, um, and we had a, like a little digital presence with that brand as well. So, um, I did a bit of that and then, yeah, my web stuff on the side and effectively kind of played in that space. Yeah. Um, and then if your leading question is, how did I get into the ecosystem? Eventually, I um, I met someone who happened to work at an SI, okay, and asked me to do some design contracting for them and yeah. some website redesign, um, and then a little bit of work around um, some of their marketing campaigns, e, e newsletters, things like that. But that wasn't Salesforce marketing campaigns, or mm, they happened to be. Okay. I, they were they were for an SI and their capabilities. And eventually it turned into Salesforce marketing campaigns. Uh, but that was Squarebit. So Squarebit oh, yeah. was my foot in and Sean Stilwell, um, Susan, who, yeah, husband and wife team, yeah. very small business, um, Will Scully Power at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a great we had a great team and a great great bunch of people. Yeah, your title was creative director. I was actually. a great yeah, yeah. yeah, I came on, I started doing the contracting and they're like, Hey, we actually need someone to do creative and I went Sure. Why not? I, I mean, I dabble in design. Yeah. I wouldn't call myself um, by no means because design is very subjective. Sure. Um, I'm, but when it came to kind of corporate design affairs and designing for the types of campaigns where we were doing where it was lead generation around technology needs um, and then through some of the work that Will wanted to be doing within there, uh, which we called Agency On Demand, which was trying to run more marketing-centric type programs on top of the Salesforce platform. Right. Um, so it was things like, you know, driving direct mail to digital through, you know, personalized pearls or personalized URLs, um, sending out email newsletters and getting live dashboard feedbacks as to who's filling in a lead form, who's RSVPing to an event, whatever it might be. Yeah. And we did that with just some little microsites that we would build, we would host on an ASP web server, we talked directly to the Salesforce API and we were able to write that back into Salesforce and that was kind of the evolution of, I mean this is before Marketing Cloud, yeah, yeah. before Marketos, before anything, this was um, how I guess it was done, I think, I mean, all credit to Will, he was pioneering that kind of level of thought and it definitely ahead of the curve, yeah. you know, it's, Salesforce has always been at least three or four years ahead of this market. Sure. And so bringing some of those concepts in. And this is also before Apex, Visual Force, any of the programmatic languages that Salesforce offers. Yeah. Now, Lightning, nothing nothing available. It was just pure API, um, speak to the Salesforce backend, and then, you know, surf that data on your, in your web page. So we did that, and I helped through that, and that was, you know, that was my title. Yeah, yeah. But um, eventually it just grew on helping with those sorts of marketing-led Programs uh, became a, um, a Eloqua partner. Um, so this was still Squarepeg. This was still quick Squarepeg. So learning through um, that marketing cloud at Ecosphere, Exact Target partner, Marketo partner, yeah. learning through that, and then eventually, yeah, eventually breaking out and doing my own thing. So, so in the Salesforce world, um, when you were hands on, mm -hmm. what kind of roles have you performed? Well, uh, all th through all my roles. Um, oh yeah, get like a, a summary of a summary of the um, what creative director. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the key um, one. And then once it once it became uh, me on my own, and uh, shout out to Ryan Holman, he's killing it right now. At Litify startup in New York. Um, but when Ryan and I w went and worked together and worked through her Holm Holman Consulting, and we just purely like this was at a stage when Salesforce was looking for 
people with enough knowledge about the product yeah. in the market. Um, and they were looking for subcontractors. Um, we happened to get one of our first gigs with a cool client that happened to sell like Tony Robbins tickets. And that was through uh, a Glenn Elliott. He's another guy killing yeah, in the yeah. startup space Practify. right now. Practify, exactly. Um, we worked with him on this customer. It was the tipping, it was Apex and Visual Force had just come out. Or we had the beta release. Yeah. So we developed a whole website shopping cart mechanism, drag and drop for internal staff to drag and drop what your seating position was to see where Tony Robbins would be. And it was, yeah, learning a brand new language from scratch, learning Salesforce from scratch, learning the whole concept of Apex and the governor limits and all of the limits from scratch. And that was kind of fun. That was a really, really cool time. Um, and that, so that was my first like out on our own role where I wasn't sort of helping with a creative piece or helping just design an API yeah. call or something like that. Um, and effectively, I mean, we were, if, for lack of a better term, full stack Salesforce consultants yeah. where you knew the back end and code and aspects of that and visual force and the front end components. And then you also knew, you know, how to load data, how to extract data from other systems, how to, you know, correlate that effectively, normalize it, create a database schema within Salesforce that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, create the right layouts for customers, make sure it's got a user-friendly appeal, um, train them, roll out, like, I mean, these, these were small teams. This yeah, is yeah. the early days of Salesforce, and um, you'd do it super nuts effectively. And so I, we would call ourselves, yeah, I guess, consultants, but we were like engineers, developers. I'm remiss to call myself a, an actual dev or an engineer because they're like design. There are people way better than me <laughs> at, at, um, at coding and development, but Salesforce had constraints, and if you're happy to work within those constraints, then it was easy enough to get a handle on, and then you, you learn like the best ways to do it. And I think learning from the ground up was a good base to have going forward. Um, so that was kind of consulting, and then beyond that, um, when Ryan and I merged with, um, with the Veltio team, and I stayed on as a stakeholder to manage the delivery team, mm -hmm. then effectively I transitioned to more of a um, kind of pro-serve director and I, we set up our methodology, we set up our teams, our pods and our hubs of different specialties, um, you know, we created our own leaders within that organisation of different facets of the, of the technology um, and yeah, that was, that was good, that was successful and then eventually um, selling that off to Blue Wolf, yeah, and through Blue Wolf, then taking a number of roles, effectively helping the transition team. I worked in a global role, focusing purely on mobile in the Salesforce ecosystem, um, based on a product that we developed when we were at Veltio, which was more of a uh, a field sales enabler on a mobile device. Yeah. So we used that IP and we extended out a little bit more. We offered it as an accelerator to customers to take on. Um, and so that was running mobile globally for Blue Wolf. And then uh, eventually that was kind of a whirlwind role where I just traveled a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't think I saw the off guys in the office a lot. Um, and then they went through a few leadership changes during the transition. And eventually when I came back, I settled to a CTO of APAC role, just really helping strategic customers and accounts on you know, what their Salesforce direction might be, sure. um, working with the Ignite teams at Salesforce on just more buzzwords, blue sky thinking around, what, you know, what can I do with this platform, where can I go, Sure. a um, little bit more of the fluffy stuff of you could be here that's aspirational, how do we get there, yeah. um, just kind of managing those discussions in a little pathway together. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, beyond that, working in, yeah, as a, as in the startup as an ISB partner, um, helping other groups become partners. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's been my life in the ecosystem. You can't escape it. Yeah, it's, and and you're. I mean, you must have been one of the first in the market here, having been on board with SquarePeg. So you oh, obviously... absolutely. I mean, SquarePeg. Credit to them. They were the first. Yeah. Like the main first partner in the market. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, every year you can see the partner. Like, this sounds like a, <laughs> a massive ad, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I love Sean, I love yeah, what they did, they, they, they were great, um, but yeah, I mean, out of all of the um, groups that were out there, they were always, uh, you know, a partner paid for their sponsorship at, at any of the tour events, 
before they were called World Tour events, before they were Cloud Forces or whatever they were, they, they'd always be at the stands yeah. um, on the front foot and talking to customers, which was exactly what Salesforce wanted, right? And sure. Their mantra was and effectively still is, you know, bring us leads, do your own BDM. You know, we need an ex extended sales team through our partner network, so yeah. help us. Yeah, and, yeah. and, yeah, they did. So that was... It was definitely on the forefront of what was going on there. Sure. Um, and then it stayed fairly small for a few years, a, a fair few years before, um, and before sort of 2012, and when we teamed up with um, Veltio, uh, a bunch of the guys from Salesforce, PS, uh, Pro Services yeah. left and started Quattro, and they did their thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where I think that was the the kind of tipping point for more and more partners yeah. sort of spreading out in the ecosystem. Sure. Before that, there was, yeah, there was only a few names here and there. Yeah. So um, you've seen a lot of change with the platform. Um, yes. Yeah, what, what products have really got your interest right now? Uh, products right now, I I mean, I like, I'm, I am a community fanboy just because yeah. <laughs> I come from that web space. Um, I mean, it doesn't do amazingly well. Customers, I think, try and tackle it a little too easily. Um, back in the day when it was customer portal and partner portal and those sorts of things, there was always really cool stories and then really bad stories, and I think it's still the same way. They've tried to um, you know, polish that product as much as they can, but there are still cool mechanisms that you can use that authentication scheme that they've got through there to extend out to customers, yeah. which is was the end goal. You know, sales is a big, big product. Sure. How do I get it in a B2C marketplace without acquiring? And then eventually, you know, they did acquire. Um, and that was, you know, that was the first portal mechanism that you could use to yeah. do that. Um, so I'm in that space, I'm a fanboy, but I think I look more about, you know, what's coming down the line in terms of getting myself excited nowadays. Like the core products and the marketing cloud products are what they are. Um, I think the cool things that are coming down the line are more about listening to that customer conversation. I think there's a, the latest acquisition earlier in May with Bonobo AI, which can kind of analyze and give insights into completely unstructured data. That's fascinating. Yeah. Like being able to hear a conversation that's not, well, it might be pointed at your brand, but is in a in the way that we are having a conversation with each other yeah. and having gaining some glisten of insight from that and be it for using it in a call center so that you know you, let's say you're doing this omni channel call center how do i prior, prioritize what i'm hearing without someone actually filling out a form going no this is high priority yeah, yeah. or without someone looking at it going oh no let me prioritize that or without like hitting a keyword that I put in a yeah. workflow or something, yeah, yeah. you know, being able to digest that conversation and go, and then take a whole bunch of unstructured data sources, compile it and say, no, this person's reached out to us through a number of channels. Sure. Here we are. This is the sentiment of what they're saying. Well, you know, we need to push this down. Yeah, yeah, we'll do and that's a really simple use case in, yeah. that, in that perspective. But I think that technology, well, I don't know what they're going to do with it um, and how they're going to integrate it, whether it is in the service cloud space or... Well, I think that's that's exciting. I think Salesforce kind of maybe missed the boat a little bit a while ago when uh, SAP acquired Qualtrics, yeah. which is, I mean, a glorified survey platform. But they have some really cool mechanisms for having a conversation with customers, sure. whether it be, you know, when you're putting your thumb up or thumb down in Netflix, yeah, yeah. so you know if you're browsing too long in Netflix and then yeah. you get out there, hey, are these titles relevant to you? Yeah, and, yeah. You know, you only get asked that question if you've been browsing too long sure. and not if you've been asked another question previously. But taking that unstructured data and what that platform does to, to crush it up and give some insights either to product development or, um, you know, service development, whatever it might be, I think that's powerful. And I think Salesforce maybe, uh, you maybe they're going to use this bonobo and something else to kind of try and up that space. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's fascinating. Like the the closer we can get to just natural language processing in technology is will be amazing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Rather than going, hey Siri, <laughs> the true story. I was in a meeting the other day with a customer, and I sometimes slur my speech, as this video will attest to, <laughs> and sometimes I talk too fast. But Siri, my phone was on the table. And Siri started just playing a song 
based on must have thought I said, Hey Siri, play whatever. No way. I don't know how it got there, but it just started playing this song. I don't have the history enabled on my Siri to see what yeah, the yeah. Water must have. So yeah, the better that they can listen. Yeah, <laughs> they. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do all yeah. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be a really good time. Yeah, yeah. cool. So this is quite a broad question. Sure. Um, but what what's your take on the current uh, market, the partner landscape? Current partner landscape. Um, I <laughs> I think it's it's interesting. It's driven a lot by the way Salesforce want their partners to be now, and. A lot of that is uh, verticalizing a lot more, which is tough in this marketplace to become a specific partner in one vertical and only focus on that vertical. Yeah, can can be tough. I don't. I personally don't believe there's enough pipeline in one specific vertical, or you know, however many they do it, maybe two or three or whatever. It's, it's tough to just focus in that space. Yeah, because you see a lot of people that say this is our specialism, but then they wouldn't turn away work in another area if it came up. No way. If every partner plays the game and goes, <laughs> yeah, we're verticalizing in what a manufacturing, retail, and distribution, MRD. This is our space. In reality, they're like, any work you've got, we'll take it. Yeah. Like, well, we do it all. And I think for partners, it's more important to have cloud competency. Like, Service cloud or community yeah. cloud or like product specific areas where it's like you know, we know that inside out and there are certain intricacies in certain areas that you know a lot of the partners that had grown up in the other space will quite happily tell you when it comes to marketing cloud they're not as familiar because it's a it's an adjunct business it's it's not something that they focused on from the ground up yeah core has generally been people's business and you see that now like you see these agencies coming you saw the amicus guys coming you see these people coming from a digital marketing space yeah, yeah. and focusing in that area, yeah. which makes more sense because they speak the language and they and they learn the tools. It takes them a while to learn the tools because sure. it's not familiar for them. Um, whereas the S, traditional SI space don't know the language. So then they maybe, they maybe know the tool or could learn the tool really well, but then don't focus. So you're getting more, you know, like, I mean, over the years we've been getting more cross-pollination, but I think it's more important for partners to be yeah, core cloud competency than anything. Sure. So I guess my opinion on the partner ecosystem is um, outside of playing that game of going, oh, I'm a, I mean, I've got an industry focus and we've got teams that do X, Y, and Z. Um, because Salesforce is such as, I mean, it's in the title. They're a sales beast. Yeah. Um, and out with, with them being a sales beast comes them wanting to utilize partners as an extended sales team. Sure. And that's really where the culture has has bred. And I think that is that becomes tough for customers, I feel for customers, because that often it, it, you don't know if you are getting an a unbiased opinion when yeah. it comes to what's either being recommended or whether it's the right approach or whatever, whatever it might be, because it's a, you know, there's, there's no kind of, I don't, I don't know. There's no regulator keeping anyone honest or yeah, anything yeah. like that, and it's um and it's a intangible solution. It's software. It's not. I'm not building you a coffee table and asking you if you want it in gold, silver, or bronze. Yeah. It's a solution architect or an enterprise architect or a program architect, then they have an idea on how to crack this nut and how to solve it. Sure. And that they one I one person's idea could be the Rolls Royce of ideas, and one person's idea could be you know, the Volkswagen of ideas. Yeah. And it's it's hard to scale that, right? Sure. So um, I think it's, it, I, I feel for customers. Wait, let's let's say that. When it yeah, comes yeah. to my opinion on the partner landscape, I feel for customers. <laughs> that's, that's my one sentence. So that, that leads me on nicely to the next question. Like, if a customer is looking to start a Salesforce journey. Yes. Like, they're moving away from something else. You know, they're, let's, let's think of it as like a, a decent size company, not a startup, so they're not just going to have a, and off the shelf implementation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your advice? Um, look, the customers, my, my advice is always, and so I think Salesforce would resonate this too, is build your core competency. Like, how back in the old days of IT, customers would work on a stack. They'd be a Java house, they'd be a, a, a .NET house, yeah. they'd be whatever, right? They'd have core skill sets. And we're, 
uh, Salesforce is big enough and enterprise enough now and has enough products in their ecosystem for you to be a Salesforce house, right? If someone asks you, okay, what, what, what kind of development team do you are oh, we run a Salesforce development team? And you, it, it, there's no shame in saying that. Yeah, yeah. I think engineers and developers might go, oh, I don't want to tie myself to a proprietary piece of software yeah. and learn that and get locked in. But there's, I mean, they're not going anywhere. It's it's core critical business systems now. Yeah. And some customers sometimes I think need to bite the bullet and go, I can't keep going out to partners, or I can, but for some more strategic plays or for some plays that we've developed internally as I did. I think some customers do it really well, right? Like the GEs of the world that have these great center of excellences internally, they have core competency teams around different clouds, they have development teams internally. And they are, you know, they're generally the things that are and customers that are being showcased at Dreamforce and grandstanded around on all yeah. the different displays and always in the case studies, of course, because they've drunk, as we would say in the ecosystem, enough Kool-Aid and they've realized we've got a significant investment in this product and this platform and this ecosystem. Why wouldn't we invest in our people understanding it and the sure. ins and outs of it and bettering it and making it better for our customers? Um, so I think... Yeah, I hope that answers you. Right. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think we are seeing more customers now saying, "Well, we do need to build an in-house team. Like we yeah. can't heavily rely on um, just a partner." And, yeah. and also because the partner, there's turnover in that partner world. So yeah, you might you might think you've got an architect from a partner for a foreseeable period of time, but they get an offer from another company paying a bit more money, and and now all of your absolutely all of the IP goes with them. Absolutely, and it still surprises me how often customers will come and talk to me and say. Oh yeah, like exactly that scenario. Had a whole bunch of IP with a a consultant or yeah. something. They've moved on. They've relied on partners for maybe a significant piece of work, and now they're like, "Well, we're stuck with that previous partner because we had some retainer or whatever." The core cool people have left, and now we're like, "What? Where? Where do we go? Yeah, what do yeah. we do?" Now we're a little stuck. How do I? How, how do I approach this? Yeah. And I understand not every customer can afford a full in-house team um, but there is there are ways to cut and slice the budget make sure that you at least account for a little bit of your investment and ensure that you have somebody in-house that has a little bit of the context and the history um, and treats it like a core critical business system that you know you don't you can keep the lights on yourself right? yeah. you want to be able to keep the lights on yourself you know if the power goes out in my house I know that there's the main switchboard and I can go and check if that's been flipped. Right? Yeah, yeah. Just basic little things like that in the concept of adding workflows and field, and yeah. creating reports, like that, that's the stuff that I think the trail, the when we were talking earlier, the trailhead things that Salesforce bring out, I think that level of skill set is great and should be, you know, rolled out more and more internally to customers. Sure. But customers need to buy into it as yeah, well. Yeah. And some customers are like, Ah, uh, yeah, I've got other people to do that for me. Yeah. But no, you, you, you can't make this investment without thinking, well, if I'm buying a car, I need to learn how to drive it. Sure. And I, I do think it's going to be interesting now because like, we are seeing more customers building these in-house teams, but mm. then we're also seeing more partners offering a managed service offering. Yeah, absolutely. So how that uptake um, comes off, like uh, are, they, are companies going to go, actually, it's easier for me to use this managed service and, and use someone in the Philippines. Yeah. Well, yeah. It will be interesting to see how it, how it does work. The yeah. Blue Wolf have had that kind of managed service. Oh, yeah, the Beyond model from, I mean, everyone's got a different name for a managed service, and everyone has a managed service. Um, I mean, it, it makes sense as a customer to buy in that fashion. Generally, you're going to get some level of, of discount for buying hours in bulk in advance. Um, it's tough for partners to manage that, obviously, because they're either managing two separate teams or a combined pool of resources yeah. on the same budget. And you know, offering my my one guy that I'm paying X amount at a discount right now because the customer's bought ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're they that's they're their own operational headaches that they deal with, sure. and that's fine. And we've dealt with it before. Um, I think it's those those managed services make sense, but you, it's like getting Salesforce support, which I don't know what sales Salesforce reps generally murmuring go. Oh, you know, they'll grow because they're incentivized to sell it, but at the end of the day, customers don't love it, right? Yeah. And you only love it if you know, it's the kind of support that you get if you know how to ask the question to get sure. help. Like you need to, uh, you need to ask that 
collect that help in the right way yeah. for you to get the right support. Sure. And that's what these managed services kind of they gel that gap, right? It's like, hey, you don't know how to ask the question. T- just tell us layman's what your terms. Tell us what your problem is, and we'll kind of solution. It support, yeah. Right. Um, those that customer support from Salesforce is really only beneficial if you've got your own team, if you understand the problem, yeah. and you can articulate it in a way that a Salesforce person will understand it and yeah, be yeah. able to execute on it. Right? Sure. And that is that almost that weird solution architecty brain set or mindset of understanding the business process and the technology and what it can do. Yeah. And maybe even if you can't do it on the technology, understanding what you want and sure. then having someone else execute on it. Um, but yeah, I think we've kind of gone off on a bit of a tangent there. But yeah, so the, the managed service space is, is going to be an interesting space. I think more and more customers working out how they enable their own teams whether they do just have an offshore employee or something, I think it definitely just makes sense to have people on the ground sure. working it out and then liaising with your vendors appropriately. Yeah, but the having the people on the ground is a struggle because yeah. the, the um, shortage of talent is definitely a real problem. Um, yes. How do you see that playing out? I think that's, uh, to be honest, I think that's Salesforce's responsibility. Or they can call me, I'll help them. Uh, <laughs> I think Salesforce's responsibility in the marketplace is definitely to educate their customers more and more. Um, you know, they, they do, I, I think they, they do a decent job. They can do better and they can help customers in it, but it's, it, it is tough for them. I understand because they work with partners and you know, they're already competing with partners themselves, having their own PS yeah. team. So then also to then go and self enable partners is almost like just biting everybody's lunch and sure. stealing it. Right. So I know it's I know it's a tough space for them, and I know the like the customer success groups at Salesforce they do great work. I think it's really enforcing that level of education to customers, and almost being a little bit more um, stringent around being able to sell them a product. As bad as that sounds, like no, you, we, look, we we won't sell you this product and have you implement it until you know X amount of your team learn this yeah, concept yeah. right because if they don't it just becomes more tech debt it fails yeah. you know the project could fail you're reliant too much on a partner to deliver it the customer doesn't know enough about it they don't know how to articulate to another partner or someone else that comes on later to inherit it mm-hmm. what's gone wrong it turns into a reimplementation yeah and these you know these are the headaches that customers are dealing with sure so i think there's a there's a certain onus on salesforce i i believe as almost a semi-regulator in this wild west, yeah. <laughs> or the sheriff in the west, to come in and, and make sure that the customers are enabled yeah. effectively. And yeah, Trailhead, I think Trailhead is the right step. It's just getting it above that that admin level of, of skill set, right? Sure. Getting it to that next level of skill set where you, maybe you learn a little bit of the historical aspects of why some of these parts of the platform are the way they are. Yeah. Why knowledge is such a weird data structure. It's because they acquired a company and then took ages to integrate it into the native stack. Why files is so cumbersome and it's not as easy as just one object to commit to for attaching a file like that. Like little basic things that people go, huh? And get confused about. Yeah. I think have, understanding the context, maybe the acquisition history, the marketing cloud piece with the exact target, like understanding how those things became part of this large platform and sure. offering would help a lot of people to yeah. go, oh, I understand. Yeah, oh, yeah. I understand. Oh, right. um, in the same way, like the like a Volkswagen and a Porsche Cayenne, right? Like understanding that your chassis, your, your Cayenne's the same as your Touareg and knowing the, the, com- the components of that, what's similar, what's not, yeah. what's different. Do I have to learn a new niche skill because of that or not? Yeah. Um, because, you know, you can learn, you can get stuck in the Salesforce core world and then you can move to marketing cloud and it's very different, so different yeah, very, yeah. very different, right? And um, a customer can get easily confused and just not go, I thought it was all Salesforce. Yeah, yeah, it's one platform. Right? right. Clicks, not code. What the <laughs> hell is going on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's, there is an onus there. I mean, generally that's, you know, customers that I work with, it's, it's trying to bridge a bit of that gap. That understanding is core. I think the more you know, knowledge is power in this industry. If you know more about what you're buying, why you're buying it, 
and where it fits right, I think that's that's a powerful way to have leverage price wise, solution wise, time frame wise, um, yeah, in, in lots of ways, and then be able to strategically cut and slice your roadmap of adopting this this ecosystem product. Yeah, cool. Um, we'll, like almost daily, we'll speak to someone that has an aspiration of starting their own business, mm -hmm. um, a consulting business, could be a product business. Yeah. Um, what's your advice to anyone that actually wants to go and do something like that? To be their own partner, effectively? So a partner could be a product company, like it's something starting in the Salesforce ecosystem. Then. Right. Uh, I mean, the Salesforce ecosystem is pretty good. There's plenty of resources out there to go and learn on your own and get across it. Um, I think when rubber hits the road and being a business owner and getting you know a pipeline generated and those sorts of things, that's where you know you're getting into more of their you know understanding how their sales cycles work, understanding what their reps are incentivized by, understanding which reps and which areas of the market you want to focus in. Sure. Are you an SMB partner? Are you a mid market partner? Yeah. Are you an enterprise solution? Where do you fit? Um, those sorts of things strategically are important to know. Obviously, a core, very good understanding of the product yeah, of helps. Um, I don't, I don't think I've ever met another a rep that doesn't want to bring a smart person in the room with them from a partner ecosystem that understands the solution and what they're talking about mm -hmm. to the customer. Even though maybe from management's perspective, uh, they're they're looking to the partner ecosystem to just help them sell more licenses. Yeah. But really, that comes from bringing knowledgeable people in the room sure. that know the product, know the ecosystem, know some context, and can can help guide a, a customer along a journey. Um, so I guess advice is, yeah, get get deep in. I mean, Trailhead is a default first spot for everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you're coming from, right? If you're not coming from a technical background, I would absolutely just do some introductory GA course into some technical sphere. Yeah. Because I think there is a, you know, Salesforce is a business solution developed by engineers. Mm -hmm. You know, Parker Harris is not a management consultant, yeah, not a yeah. business leader, even though he is a co-founder. I mean, he's a, he's a CTO, he's a, he's a tech head, and yeah. he developed this platform with his team as an engineer, and you can see that in the product. You can see the way that the data is structured, and there has been a logical sense of thought going into it, and not having that that level of soft skill before you jump into uh, being a partner or consultant or having a product, it yeah it can it can hold you back. I think. Cool. Um, you have been out of Blue Wolf for a few years now. What's what's like? What's your main focus? Where are you adding most value now? Adding most value? Do I add value? <laughs> uh, look, I mean, working with Customers that call me from time to time and ask me about what they're trying to do with the Salesforce ecosystem. I have my own book of private clients. Um, outside of that, you know, I've got, I still have this kind of closet passion of the field sales space um, and work with partners in how to solve that problem for customers. Field service lightning came out a while ago. And we had a product at Veltio called Nomad, and it was for that industry, and it was supposed to solve that problem of IFV. And even though you know we have a point of view that that industry is dying to an extent, you know heads are being cut, mm -hmm. there aren't as many dollars to be able to put into field sales representatives for industry. How do I digitize that space? How do I make it more efficient for the people that I do have? Yeah. Um, so I'm still quite passionate in helping organizations in that space. And there's a number of options to go for in that space, I, I believe. Um, and yeah, I've worked with a few different organizations on providing solutions. Um, but realistically, I mean, I, I, I keep my head in the Salesforce ecosystem. I help, I find myself more and more helping other people like in your previous questions that either want to become partners or want to start a product and they just need some help on how to go, go through the ringer with Salesforce, or they need some help on what kind of skill sets they might need internally. Yeah. Um, for those organizations as well, I would definitely say, you know, if you're coming from a space and now you want to jump on the Salesforce gravy train, there, there's an investment to be made. It's not instant flow of work and pipeline and all that kind of yeah. stuff. I think there's a there's there's effort that goes into it, and so just a Forewarning to everybody that you know, put the effort in, spend a lot of my own hard dollars of yeah. going down those paths as well, and you 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 learn, but 
I think you've just got to be prepared for, to, to eat that a little bit. And eventually, you know, you build up a good core clientele. Um, you know, there's that, there's that book, The Trusted Advisor, and it, it's for a consultant, full stack consultant in the Salesforce yeah. space. You know, that's your end goal ultimately. Um, you want to help your customer realize an expensive asset as best they can. So if you're like a, if you think of it where people, we're training people to drive their Ferrari as fast as they can, right? And they want to drive it as fast as they can. So yeah. you want to help them go along that path, whether that's helping them select the right partner, the right product, the right suite of app store products, whatever it might be, which is not always a great idea, just selecting a bunch of app store products, yeah. like exchange products. Um, but I think that's, um, that's, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Cool. And we've spoken about previous acquisitions, so I'm going to ask you to predict now. Um, <laughs> so nothing that we already know about, but what would make sense from a further like acquisition or, or where can Salesforce take the product that we don't already know is going? Right. Well, I think, I think the latest, I think I kind of let, touched on it with the, the throwback to Qualtrics and SAP's acquisition of Qualtrics. I don't, I mean, Salesforce have a survey tool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's there. It's something. Um, I think working like there's a, there is a gap in that space. The Bonobo AI allows them to, to crunch that data potentially in some mechanism of that unstructured conversation. It's the mechanism to be able to have that, um, conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's companies like Campaign Monitor, which I suppose think Salesforce is invested in anyway, get feedback. I think those... Those sorts of tools that can do it in a little, little bit of a, um, uh, a less brutal way of just going, here's a survey. Yeah. You know, um, if I look at Qualtrics, they've got uh, SDKs for being able to implement these sort of soft surveys into mobile applications, into web transactions, um, and, as well as offering mechanisms to have those sorts of conversations, whether they be fo focus groups that they skill up internally, and then they start talking about products and product awareness and those sorts of things. And, crunch that information. I think Salesforce have the opportunity to take some of their products, mash it up and, and get ahead of the curve in that, I guess, analyzing the conversation or deconstructing the conversation because there is a, there's a lot of clutter, mm -hmm. not to use a Salesforce product term, but there's a lot of chatter out there about brands and it's, I think it's just this nut that every brand has been trying to crack. You know, how do I monitor that? conversation that sentiment and not so much in, in, in not so much uh, push it in a certain direction or push an agenda but at least have an open conversation understand where's our where do our priorities sit what are people buzzing about um, from all the different mechanisms that people are able to have communications with brands now Cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, if people do want to reach out to you, are you a social media guy? Like, what's the best way to... LinkedIn's do easiest. Yeah. Um, you can throw me a ping on LinkedIn. Um, Busy guy. Might take a... <laughs> no, you can take me a... Yeah, LinkedIn's probably the easiest. My name on Instagram, you can hit me up. Yeah. It's probably just photos of me and my son. Yeah, right yeah. That, that one. Right. Thank you so much for coming on. I've really enjoyed the chat. And I'm sure the audience will too, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.